You know what we haven't done in a long time, Jordan, is a road trip. Yeah, man, how many days? Days? No, we're gonna do Southern Alberta. I mean, you know, like, that's all the gas money we have. I'd like to sleep in my own bed tonight. Well, how far are we gonna go? Like, you know. Welcome back, Deep Your View TV viewers. It is Chris Nichols here, and you know, it was over three years ago that we did our very first video for Deep Your View TV. That was the Sony a7 III, and there's a wildly popular full-frame camera. You know, it was affordable, decent image quality, great autofocus at the time, altogether a very light, compact package, and it became an incredibly popular camera for the enthusiast market. But frankly, there wasn't a lot of competition. Fast forward to present day, and there's so many great cameras out there. Nikon Z6 IIs, Canon EOS R6s, Panasonic S1s, the list goes on and on. And so much has changed technologically in those three and a half years as well. But now we have a brand new Sony a7 IV to play with. Now this is a highly anticipated camera, but with lots of expectations upon it. So I wanna see how much of that modern Sony technology has made its way into this camera and will it live up to expectations? We're gonna find out. So the first stop when we head south on our road trips is the town of Nanton, and we always drive past here, but we've never actually stopped into the Nanton Air Museum. So we're gonna pop in there now. They do great work restoring and keeping things for posterity. If you're in the area, you should definitely check it out, but this will be a great place to do low light tests. All right, so we've just left Nanton in the Air Museum, had a great time in there. Now we're in the lovely town of Staveley. The first thing I really noticed, this feels a lot like a Sony A1 or you know A7R4, A7S3, one of the newer cameras on the market there. I like the larger grip that those other cameras have. It's been incorporated here. I feel like this would be a nice stable platform if I'm using longer, heavier glass. We have one very interesting change here though, control wise. We now have quadruple control dials, but they're all customizable. So I've got my standard front dial, my standard back dial for my thumb. We have the much maligned rotating dial on the back, the joypad, which has never brought me any joy. But luckily we now have this fourth control dial up here. Now on a lot of other Sony bodies, this is fixed as an exposure compensation dial. But here I can now set this up to do a myriad of things, you know, ISO, white balance, app, aperture, shutter, you know, lots of stuff, and it does still have a locking control, which I like. I still use ISO on the back pad here, and I'm just keeping this as my exposure compensation, but I do like that you could really customize how the camera feels. We get that same great updated autofocusing joystick that you'll find on cameras like the A1, and this does actually happen to bring joy on a regular basis. I like using it very easy. We also have touchscreen controls, and that works in the menu because we have the same menu systems from the A7S III and A1, which, of course, we love. Overall, this camera seems to handle a lot like a full flagship Sony body. And if you are coming from one of those cameras, you're gonna find this very familiar. If you're coming from an A7 III, this is gonna be, in handling terms, a huge step up. Now let's talk about displays, especially compared to the a7 III. So the back panel is still just over a million dots, nothing fancy there, it does fully articulate. Now when it comes to the EVF, we do have a bit of an improvement here. We're moving up to a 3.69 million dot EVF, which is in line with the price point, very similar to the competition. Now we do have issues sometimes with Sony cameras where the resolution of that EVF will change when you're focusing or not focusing, that kind of stuff can be distracting. So I do wanna talk about how the EVF works here. So first off, we have a menu option to change the quality from standard to high. Now this does give you a noticeable improvement in resolution. However, when you're focusing the camera in tracking mode, it does drop back down to the standard resolution and then pop back up when you stop focusing. I'm not finding it that jarring, but it is noticeable. You also have the option to go to 120 frame per second refresh rate, which is nice for keeping up with sports and action, but then you do go down to the standard quality setting by default. Now keep though in mind, there's no difference when you're focusing or not focusing, so you actually might find that's preferential if you want to do fast action shooting. 
Mm. Wise words. You want another hard truth here? Sensors aren't created equally either, and that's by far one of the most exciting things about the new A7 IV. We have a big step up in resolution to a 33 megapixel sensor. Now, it is not a stacked chip, and that's gonna have some interesting ramifications for video and for still photography when it comes to electronic shutter. But for now, let's go take some photos, get some shots, and evaluate this new sensor. So we took a lovely jaunt through the Willow Creek Valley. Now we find ourselves in idyllic Turner Valley. And uh, while we're driving the car, well, we did some buffer tests. And the A7 IV will shoot 10 frames per second, RAW plus JPEG with autofocus tracking for well over 800 shots. I mean, that's basically an unlimited buffer. Uh, and that's quite respectable, especially for an enthusiast level camera. However, it does come with one major caveat. That's only when we're talking about shooting compressed lossy raw. And unfortunately, it's not ideal for your image quality. Now, one amazing thing about the A7 IV is it does have the new lossless compressed raw format, which basically halves your file size, no image quality loss. This is an amazing feature brought over from the Sony A1. However, using that mode, our frame per second rate drops to maybe five frames per second. I would still get a basically unlimited buffer. I mean, I shot a couple hundred shots before I gave up. So that is impressive, but if you want 10 frames per second, it's JPEG or raw, lossy compressed only. Now here we are at the Ball Diamond in Turner Valley. Imagine a splendid, folksy, small town ball game going on behind me. It's a good opportunity to talk about autofocus. Now I wouldn't say that we've had a lot of demanding autofocusing tests today, but we did just have three white-tailed bucks walk behind us right here in town and subject detection animals picking up their eyes quickly, no problem. And I do love Sony's real-time tracking and their eye detect for humans as well. I mean, it works effectively and it works very simply and intuitively. So although we're not gonna get the same performance as we would on the Sony A1, I'm pleased with it. And honestly, if you're coming from a Sony a7 III, this is gonna feel like a night and day upgrade. All right, so we've had a good day, but a long day, and uh, we're gonna head back to town now. Got a lot of samples today, but I really wanna get them home on the computer, evaluate them, have a look before I have my final conclusion on the new sensor. Uh, also, I know Jordan wants to go get some video samples, so we're gonna cut over to him and do his video talk here shortly, but first thing we have to do is actually get home. As soon as my chauffeur drops the camera and gets in the car and gets to me there, come on. Hey everyone, it's Jordan to talk about the a7 IV as a video tool, and the a7 III was a hugely popular video camera, but it has been getting quite long in the tooth, and all of the major upgrades that Sony have done to their video formats have been limited to the a7S III, the A1, more expensive niche cameras. The great thing is almost all of those video features have been brought over to the a7 IV, and I'm going to walk you through some of those, as well as some really cool new features that we've only seen on this camera. So the major upgrade that we're seeing here is that this camera is able to take that 33 megapixel images, uses it to create oversampled 4K, and it can do that up to 30 frames per second, where on the previous a7 III, switch it to 4K 30, you'd have a crop. Now, that's not to say there are no crops in this camera. It's capable of recording 4K 60, which is really cool, but unfortunately, you're gonna move to a 1.5 times Super 35 kind of sensor crop on that. The downside of the oversampled video is rolling shutter. It's actually a bit worse than the a7 III at 4K up to 30p. Now at 4K 60, it's a bit better because it's just using the central region of the sensor. But this is the biggest disappointment for me in the video performance. One other thing that this doesn't offer is 4K 120, which is still limited to the a7S III and the A1. So if you need crazy detailed, super slow motion, those are still better options. Speaking of the a7S III, that's the camera that introduced 10-bit recording to the Alpha camera lineup, and it was very sorely needed. Looking at the a7S III, that camera had S-Log3, which is their widest dynamic range color profile, but it didn't work very well with the 8-bit codec that camera offered. The image would really fall apart all the time. Having 10-bit recording, S-Log3 is now very usable, and I should mention this is a dual-gain camera like a lot of Sony's recent cameras, so shooting S-Log3, your native sensitivities are 800 ISO and 30 
3200 ISO. But on top of S-Log3, you also get the S-Cinema Tone profile, which I absolutely loved on the other cameras. Doesn't require a lot of grading, but has a nice wide dynamic range. If I'm not shooting an extremely contrasty scene, that's the profile I'm gonna fall back on most of the time. All right, let's talk about video autofocus. One of the things that the a7 III was really lacking was an intuitive video autofocus system, and now we've got Sony's real-time tracking. So for a bit of a stress test, Chris is shooting me at f1.2 right now, and you can see the system is doing a wonderful job, but again, just very simple. Tap the subject that you want on the LCD screen and it'll begin tracking it. Now, unfortunately, you have to use the LCD screen, so I'd love to see some sort of option where when I'm using the electronic viewfinder, I could push a button to initiate tracking that way. Otherwise, I have to take my eye off the viewfinder, tap the screen. It's a little clunky, but it is a very effective system. And again, coming from an a7 III, this is a huge upgrade. Now this camera does offer in-body image stabilization. However, I found Sony's implementation is not the most effective, especially if you're planning to like walk with the camera or something like that. However, they do include gyro metadata from the camera right in the metadata when you record your video clips. And afterwards, you can apply that to Sony's Catalyst Browse software. It'll let you apply another level of digital stabilization. Now, at faster frame rates, higher shutter speeds, this works really well. Just remember, if you're shooting 24 frames per second at a 50th of a second, this can often look really, really weird. I mean, it's nice that they give you this option, but just don't expect it to perform perfectly all the time. So those are a lot of features that have been brought down from the higher end cameras, but this also has a couple of completely new tools we haven't seen on any other Sony cameras. And the one I'm most excited about is breathing correction. Now lens breathing is when you focus a lens from minimum to infinity, you'll see kind of a zooming effect a lot of the time. It can be really distracting. So what Sony's done is they will apply a crop to the image and then as you rack focus, it'll just correct so you don't see the edges of the frame moving at all. And you can see here, even with the 50mm 1.2, which is a crazy breathing lens, uh, you don't see that zooming effect at all. It completely corrects for it. Now, there are quite a few things to remember. It is cropping your image, so it's necessarily going to degrade your image quality if you put a lens on with a lot of breathing. But also, this isn't going to work with any third-party options, and even a lot of Sony lenses aren't supported. But I really hope we'll see more lenses supported in the future, maybe even third-party though I'm not holding my breath when we're talking about breathing for that happening. One other thing I would really love to see is we know the metadata for these breathing corrections are in the video files, so it'd be great if I could choose to apply them afterwards in post using, say, Sony's own Catalyst software, because then I could decide what's more distracting, having the breathing effect in the shot or having some degradation of the image when I apply that crop. It'd be nice to be able to make that decision after the fact. The other brand new feature is a focus assist tool called Focus Map. Now this is really interesting. What it does is it'll just put a red or blue filter on top of whatever is behind or in front of the focus plane and whatever is actually in focus, that's gonna be shown in its normal colors. Now it is super distracting. I would not leave this on all day. I would just pop it on when I'm doing really critical focus pulls. But in those situations, I think it's better than peaking and it's a really useful tool. I'd just like to see it added in firmware to the A1, the A7S, and I wouldn't be surprised if Sony does that. Now, the E7 IV has a ton of network and connectivity options, and we're not gonna to touch on all those in this preview video, but I have to mention that this is the best webcam implementation I've seen from a mirrorless camera. I, a lot of mirrorless cameras now have their own software packages you can use to use them as streaming tools, but unfortunately, they're all pretty cumbersome, require extra software. With this, you just plug the camera through USB into the computer. Your computer sees it as a webcam and away you go with your Zoom meeting or whatever, but with really nice quality, it'll output 1080p or 720. It also has a 4K option, but it's only at 15 frames per second, so it's kind of useless, but even if you look at this as just a great 1080 streaming cam, it's a really nice option to have. One really nice feature that would go hand in hand with the streaming functionality is Sony's product showcase mode that we saw in the ZV-E10 and ZV-1. What it did is it would focus on your face until you held something up and then it would focus on that. Great if you're demonstrating a product, hence the name, and it would be perfect for the streaming support on this camera, but unfortunately Sony's not including it in any of their full frame mirrorless cameras. I think it would be a great feature to have and I'd love to see it added. So this camera's doing some really impressive things with video recording, so I was very concerned about overheating. Went and ran some overheat tests. Now, I didn't have access to a very hot day to test it, so I did room temperature in my basement, and here's my results in the oversampled 4K 24P mode. There, I got two hours and 23 minutes before the camera didn't 
overheat. It's just the battery died on it. No overheat warning on the camera and it was warm to the touch, but it wasn't hot, nothing that would make me uncomfortable. Next test I did was 4K 60 and I got basically the same results there. Two hours and 19 minutes before the battery died. Camera was still pretty warm. The battery was a little bit hot, but nothing that's gonna worry me. I think if you're shooting in more controlled situations, you're not gonna have any issues with overheating, but we'll have to see how it does in warmer climates. Overall, the a7 IV is a really complete video package, and in a lot of ways, it's actually a better video tool than the a7S III, which is more expensive and supposed to be their dedicated video camera. Remember, this has 33 megapixel stills, so it's just a better hybrid device than that camera. What I'm really curious about is how it's gonna to compare to a lot of the competition from other brands, and we're gonna to touch on that when we do our full review, which you're gonna to need to subscribe to see. So we're gonna stand here until you subscribe. Chris isn't gonna talk. He's not gonna bring this review home until you, thank you. Okay, over to Chris. Okay, so lots of video features to digest, but let's talk about photography again because I've had a chance to look at the images. Now keep in mind, this is an initial review. We still can't open the RAW file, so I can't really talk about things like dynamic range. We're gonna have to wait for the full review for that, but I have had a chance to look at the JPEGs and this is what I'm finding. It looks a lot like Sony's other backside illuminated sensors. 33 megapixels, we're getting great detail here. Low light performance, I'm actually seeing is actually very similar to what we saw out of 24 megapixel sensors. So my initial conclusion is that the JPEGs are giving us lots more resolution and we're not taking a hit on anything like low light performance. So I think anybody who gets a Sony a7 IV is really going to appreciate the higher megapixel count here, but you know what will hurt your image quality overall? Dust on your sensor. Luckily, like many other modern cameras, we now have an option to turn on a feature in the menu so that when you turn the Sony off, the shutter closes, and when you're changing lenses, that should help keep dust off the sensor. But this is what the sensor isn't. It is not a full frame stacked CMOS chip like the higher end cameras. And what that means is rolling shutter is still an issue. We don't have a very fast scan speed on this sensor. In fact, with our testing, we actually found it to be slightly slower than its competition in the Canon EOS R6. All that means is if you are using electronic shutter, you want to avoid moving the camera a lot or shooting moving subjects a lot. But again, this is par for the course in this price range. So this camera has been a long time coming, but I think Sony did a really nice job of creating a new modern enthusiast level camera. Cause you gotta remember, first off, Sony's made a lot of big technological strides in the last few years, but it's been mostly limited to very niche cameras like, you know, video centric cameras or sports centric cameras. And this was kind of lacking in this sort of entry level to enthusiast market. You were kind of left with either going Sony a7C, which, you know, although great autofocusing was quite a compact body, not a lot of customizability, fairly poor displays, or you could go with the original a7 III, but it's been really showing its age, doesn't have any of the new benefits. So I think this is really a great camera now. We have an option for a serious enthusiast camera or higher end niche cameras if you need to go there or a compact pocketable a7C. And it really makes the lineup make more sense. Now it's not just about upgrading an aging platform for Sony, they also have to make a competitive enthusiast camera because the competition have really been making good strides. I think it's worth mentioning the Panasonic S1 as an alternative. It's got great video features, rugged body, excellent displays, definitely a larger feel. Some people are gonna like that, but the autofocus performance is gonna be a little bit behind. But by far the fiercest competition for the a7 IV is gonna be the Canon EOS R6. So first off, very similar video capabilities, but the R6 can shoot 4K, 6 60p without as heavy a crop. But I think the biggest advantage for the EOS R6 is actually its shooting speed for sports, action, and wildlife. The Canon EOS R6 in electronic shutter mode can go up to 20 frames per second, whereas the Sony a7 IV is going to be lagging behind. But do keep in mind, the Sony does give you a big jump up in megapixel resolution. And if you're doing large prints or you need higher megapixels or bigger crops, well, that might be a big advantage for you. Now, does the Sony a7 IV represent a fairly substantial price increase over where you'd expect, like an a7, a7 II, or a7 III to have started on the market? Yeah, absolutely, but hopefully this video shows you that for that extra money, you are getting a lot of improvements. If you have any questions, please leave those in the comments below. We'd love to answer those. Check out our sample gallery. Links are in the description below. You can see the shots that we took on this camera. Do like, subscribe, comment. We always appreciate the feedback, and we shall see you guys soon for another episode of DP Review TV.